Hello everybody, welcome to learning to name chemicals and write chemical formulas. This is going to be the first part of our series. It'll actually contain four uh, individual videos and we're going to begin with simple ionic compounds. And then we're going to discuss what other types of bonding will occur so that we can look at where we're going to head in the future. We'll learn to name chemicals and then we'll learn to write a chemical formula from a name. The first part thing that we need to worry about is what is a binary ionic compound? It's one of the simplest compounds made um, and we'll take it piece by piece. Binary means that it's made from two separate elements. The compound means, means that it's made from different elements. You can't bond two of the same thing together, say two chlorines and call it a compound. And lastly, ionic. If it's ionic, that refers to the type of bonding that's happening, and ionic bonding, simple enough, occurs between ions. Or another way of saying that is that one of the elements that's involved in this compound loses electrons, and the other one is going to gain those electrons. The last way we can describe it, and the way we're generally going to refer to it in this class, is that it's a type of bonding that occurs between a metal and a nonmetal. We talked last unit about the fact that metals tend to lose electrons and nonmetals tend to gain. So it's the perfect combination of the first two definitions. Since we're going to be talking about binary ionic bonding today, we want to take a look briefly about other types of bonding so that you'll know what's going to come in the future. One type of bonding is called metallic bonding, and it involves the bonding of two metals together. Covalent bonding will involve the bonding of two non-metals together. And today we're going to take a look at ionic bonding, which is the bonding of a metal to a non-metal. Um, so we're basically going to be looking at, say, this region here of the triangle, where you have metals and non-metals. You'll notice that there's a gap here because there's no such thing as true ionic bonding. Uh, but we use it as a model anyway. Um, and the triangle is trying to point out that as you get further from this corner, ionic bonding kind of morphs into a covalent bonding. And that ionic bonding, if you go this direction on the triangle, will morph into metallic bonding. So what is an ionic bond? It's kind of complicated. But today we're going to stick with the fact that if a metal bonds with a non-metal, we will call that an ionic bond, and we will um, just treat that as a pretty rough measure of how we can actually um, go about using this naming system. So before we leave here, we're going to first set up some or review some facts that we learned last unit. The alkali metals here will generally take a plus one charge when they lose their electron. The alkali earth metals are going to take a plus two charge because they have two valence electrons and they tend to lose them. Uh, the boron family will generally take a plus three charge and carbon either takes a plus or a minus four. Uh, nitrogen generally a minus three, a minus two for the oxygen family, and the hal halogens generally take a minus one. Now that we have reviewed the charges that elements tend to take once they formed ions, let's learn how to write a name from a formula. So if I gave you a formula of NaCl, the first thing I want you to do is to write out the names of the two elements that are inside there. So we would write down sodium and chlorine. Now, sodium and chlorine are two single elements. But in this case, sodium chloride has actually married them together. They're now bonded. So in America, at least in my generation, when women got married, they would always change their last name. Um, so we look here, and what's going to happen is the chlorine is going to change its last name to indicate that it's now a bonded chemical. And it's going to become sodium chloride. And the IDE ending here is an indication that it's no longer just sodium sitting next to chlorine, but that the sodium and the chlorine are now married. They're sodium chloride. Now why doesn't sodium change its name? Why don't men change their names when they get married? It's a convention. It's just the way uh, scientists have chosen to write them. So let's take another one. Let's say I give you a chemical formula 
K2O. So for the time being, I want you to totally ignore the subscripts, the numbers at the bottom down here, and just follow the same procedure. K is potassium. and O is oxygen. So we want to imply that potassium has bonded to oxygen so we're going to take the last three letters of its name and we're going to chuck those and we are going to make it into its married name. Now these rules that I'm going to give you always need to be bent so that it sounds nice. So if we did this it would be potassium oxide. Nobody says that. So instead, you're going to write potassium oxide. Um, how do you know how much of the, the, the element's name to keep? It's kind of a feel for it thing. You just get used to hearing the language, and then it'll, um, it'll sort of feel natural to you. So K2O is potassium oxide. And a lot of people ask, well, don't I have to do something with this too? And in a binary ionic compound, you you send a signal about the number in a different way and we'll talk about that later but you really just name the two elements that are in there and then tell people that they're bonded together using the IDE ending so here's another one let's try MgF2 so Mg is magnesium and F is fluorine but we want to tell people that fluorine is now married, so it's going to be magnesium fluoride. Magnesium fluoride. So at this point, uh, I want to have you try one more with me, and then we're going to um, try a couple that you're going to do on your own. So uh, the last one we're going to do together is going to be Ca3P2. So Ca is calcium, and P is phosphorus, and we're going to get rid of the phosphorus part there and marry that thing, so it's now going to be calcium phosphide, calcium phosphide. Now you try some. I want you to take the, net, the following two chemicals and try naming them on your own. So the ones I want you to do on your own are uh, BaI2 and CS2S. Oops, CS2S. So name those two. Pause the video here for a second. Name them, and then we'll get back together. So hopefully BAI2 you named as barium iodide and the CS2S you named as cesium sulfide. The IDE ending again tells you that the two uh, elements have been bonded together and we don't talk about the numbers at all. We just call it what the two elements are, stick them together. Okay, so that's half the process. But we need to be able to switch this around. If I give you the name, how do you figure out what the formula is? But before we do that, um, we need to actually come up with, and talk about some fundamentals of making compounds. So some fundamental rules are this. Elements always bond together in whole number ratios. Okay, you can't have half a carbon bonding with two-thirds of a nitrogen. They are whole number ratios. And the total charge of a compound is always zero. Okay, you can't have, you can't add up all the different charges like we talked about up here um, and get a number that is other than zero or else you're still working with an ion. So we need the total charge of anything we put together to be zero. So let's look backwards at some of the things we wrote. Uh, we drew an NaCl. Na took a plus one charge, it's in the first family, the alkali metals, and chlorine is a halogen, so it takes a minus one charge, and a plus one and a minus one give us a total charge of zero. We worked with K, 
H2O, or potassium oxide. Now I'm going to write this out the long way as K, K, and O. K generally takes a plus one charge because it's an alkali metal, um, and a plus one charge because we have two of them, and oxygen generally takes a minus two. So a plus two, or sorry, a plus one, a plus one, and a minus two will give you a total charge of zero.